Hi, I'm Mike Bellevue, and today I'm down in the shop, and um, I'm going to be doing a kind of video that um, probably my least favorite video to watch on YouTube. So I didn't really think I'd be doing one of these, but as it turns out, uh, it may be more fun than I thought it was going to be. This is essentially an unboxing video. <clears throat> and the thing that we're going to cover is the Robert E. Lee commemorative 1971 made by Colt. And this is a real Colt. And um, like I say, I, ordinarily I would not do an unboxing video, but the fact of the matter is I had spent quite a bit of time with this gun this week because and here it is it's never been fired in fact it was still in its original packing grease from 1971 so 50 years of grease hardening in here when I, when I first got this thing I could barely cock the action and I mean it felt terrible but but I was pretty sure of what it was <clears throat> and I was right so I stripped this baby down to the screws and cleaned all the grease out of it, out of the nipples, out of every nook and cranny. And then uh, oiled it up, put it back together. And I've got to say, it feels just fine. And, you know, while I was working on it, of course, I got to spend a lot of time with each individual part. So I thought I would explain a little bit about these guns and, and give you a look at what came in the commemorative uh, because it was actually a, a pretty fascinating little package and these are the first second generation Colts uh, Colt black powder and a lot of people think that uh, you know second generation Colt black powder guns are just hopped up with birdies you know that they were made in Italy or mostly made in Italy and just maybe finished off by Colt uh, with the beautiful, you know, royal blue finish and color case hardening. And that could not be farther from the truth. There's a lot of misconceptions about this. So I'm going to do a full video on this, and I'll go through the whole bit of how these things were made. But I'll give you a little bit today, because I, I think we ought to, like, prick that bubble for people who think that these are just, you know, Uberties on steroids for three times the money. Uh, there's a reason they cost the money that they do. And they are beautiful guns. So let me take you through the Robert E. Lee commemorative box set. And uh, after that, we'll have another video where we take it out to the range and I'll give you a whole historical rundown on it. So let's, let's get this thing on the bench. Okay, <laughs> you know, this is a little behind-the-scenes stuff here. Um, when I first pulled this gun out of the box, I cocked it. It felt so sluggish. I mean, it was hard to cock. It was kind of just awful feeling. And I was pretty sure I knew what it was. This, this gun was built in 1971. It's a collector's piece. I would say it has never been fired, and it's been sitting in its shipping grease since 1971. <laughs> so, I'm starting to disassemble it, and I'm going to clean every single part on it. I've, I've done the cylinder, and, uh, you know, no, no big surprise there. I am pulling all sorts of grease off of here. So what I'm using is a combination of acetone, which is a degreaser, and I'm using croil, which is a penetrating oil. And now I'm doing the nipples. So I'm working on the first one right now. And what I've been doing is taking a sewing needle and uh, I'm going to show you. All right, that, that line is grease. In fact, I'm going to take this one. I'm going to poke it right in here. Yeah, 
that one's pretty well blocked. If you could feel it. I'm just getting grease on top of grease out of there. So, I'm gonna go through a pipe cleaner. See, see what I'm extruding right here? All that is inside the nipple. Look at that. <laughs> it's kind of like cleaning air wax out of a kid that refuses to take a bath for a year. Look, you can see it coming out. So I gotta clean the whole gun up, get all that grease out of it. And that should get everything moving again. And basically, every nook and cranny that can have grease in it <laughs> has grease and plenty of it. <laughs> I'm going to go through a lot of pipe cleaners today. So ultimately, I took the gun down right to the screws. Uh, the action was packed with grease. Every part had to be degreased and all the cavities had to be degreased. It was a mess. I didn't think you guys would be interested in that, so I didn't film the whole thing, but I've gotten a lot of comments about it. So I've got another gun, a Colt Signature Series, that's going to require the same treatment, so I'll, I'll film that whole thing and do a video on it. So with all the grease cleaned out of it, the gun, uh, the gun reassembled and lubed, now we can start looking at what comes in the Robert E. Lee commemorative package. Well, I have never been a fan of unboxing videos. And here I am, essentially, I'm going to do one. Um, I kind of just can't help myself because I think this is so cool. So what I've got here is a Robert E. Lee commemorative made in 1971. And this is a second-generation Colt 1851 Navy. And um, if you're interested in second and third generation Colt cap and ball six guns. I absolutely recommend this book. It's by Eric Deaton. And I've done a book review uh, on the channel on this before. But this book is phenomenal and it has information on every single Colt black powder revolver made in the second and third generations. So, uh, it's just it's just really a phenomenal book to read. And these are kind of important because these were actually the first of the second generation guns, which a lot of people don't know. Uh, so these preceded what are called the C, C series guns. But these guns were a Colt's entry into the cap and ball market uh, that had heated up quite a bit in the late 1860s, uh, late 1960s, uh, largely because of the centennial of the Civil War. So by 1871, Colt wanted to get back in the game. Uh, they were able to use their machines for the single-action army for some of the work on these things, and they went to Val Forge it, and they asked Val to basically honcho the project, to uh, get needed parts from Italy, and to uh, honcho the project through Colt. And I don't want to talk a lot about second generation guns, because when I do the detailed video on this gun, I'll, I'll go into great detail on it. But I'm just going to say that uh, a lot of people think that these guns are just hopped up Uberti's. That's all it is, an Uberti with a nice Colt finish. And that's really not true at all. Uh, basically, the way these things were built, and, and Val Forget of Navy Arms, and Val is, is the guy who actually created the replica market. I, I never knew Val Sr. I knew Val Jr. And uh, I know Val Forget III. Uh, now, Navy Arms is quite different now, and, and Val uh, imports a lot of military surplus. That's, that's kind of his, his thing, more than uh, the cowboy gun and Civil War replicas. 
But, uh, you know, Val Forge the first really got the replica market going out of Italy. And he always wanted to do this, this project with Colt. Uh, Colt was interested. So in 1970, they started figuring this out. And what Val did is he brought in rough forgings from Uberti. And uh, I should say, really, they were cast, rough castings from Uberti. And it was the, uh, the barrels, the cylinders, and the back straps. Everything else was made in Colt's plant in Hartford. The nipples, the screws, everything else, trigger guards, uh, loading levers, internal action parts, all made by Colt on these guns. Now, that wasn't the case on all the guns, but it was the case on these commemoratives and on the C-Series guns that followed them. Those were the ones that were actually made in Colt's plants. Now, I talked about those castings that came from Uberti, and, you know, a lot of people think that uh, it was a barrel that probably only had to be polished. <laughs> you know, they say rough castings. That's not the case. This is what castings look like. Uh, these are revolver frame castings, all, all different ones. There's Remington's Colt, a bunch of them in there. But this is the kind of thing that Colt got to work with. So these all had to be machined uh, to their final configuration and then polished and, you know, bored and the, the whole nine yards. So this is not like it was a 90% finished gun and all I had to do was polish it. Uh, Colt manufactured these guns. And Val Forget uh, oversaw it, and every single part that Colt made was tracked all the way through the factory into the gun it was going on. So these guns are in every respect a Colt. Now... <clears throat> The original kits came as pairs. Uh, there was a Robert E. Lee and a Ulysses S. Grant. They came in their own cases, and you could buy them as a pair with matched serial numbers. The only difference was, I'm going to show you down here. I hope you can see it. There. Okay, right there, it's 823-REL, Robert E. Lee. If it had been a Grant gun, it would be USS. Uh, and the same number. So they expected a lot of these to sell as as pairs, but they also offered them individually. The total production of Lee and Grant commemorative sets uh, was 4,750 revolvers. And of that, 250, uh, or actually, 500, uh, but 250 sets of them were combined Grant and Lee sets. So the remainder, uh, which is quite a bit, uh, basically, you know, 4,500 revolvers were individual Grant or Lee revolvers. They were both 1851 navies and this is what it looks like. It has the rounded trigger guard. It's got the large oval trigger guard, which when I do uh, when I do my my look at um, at Colt Navy's the evolution of them, I'll explain the difference in trigger guards. After this, the second generation Navy's had the squared off early trigger guard, which I have to admit I don't like as much. I don't feel it's as comfortable, which is one of the reasons that I. As I was about to say, one of the reasons I was looking for a Robert E. Lee commemorative kit is because it has the rounded trigger guard, which I prefer, uh, as opposed to the Ulysses S. Grant commemorative, which has the square-backed trigger guard. So for me, the, the Lee is just uh, a more attractive and better-feeling gun in my hand. So besides the trigger guard, if you were to buy the Robert E. Lee and the Ulysses S. Grant commemoratives separately, right, as separate box packages. Uh, the only other difference besides the trigger guard is the powder flask that comes with them. 
So you can see that we've got the uh, kind of the typical bag flask for the Robert E. Lee, and uh, we've got the more streamlined flask in the picture below that for the Ulysses S. Grant commemorative. And that's really the only difference between the two. So this is a, a standard Navy configuration. This, this would have been a gun that would have fit right in, say, circa 1862, uh, though it has an interesting mix of features on it, which when I do the full-blown thing, I'll tell you about. So it has the Colt address on the top of the barrel. Address, Sam Colt, New York City. But in addition to that, it has Robert E. Lee commemorative 1971 on the side flat of the barrel. Other than that, it has the Colt's patent marks. It's got the roll engraved cylinder. And it is a typical mid-production Navy. It's got a 7.5-inch octagon barrel. It has a color case hardened loading lever. That's a hinged lever, as all navies are. Color case hardened frame. No, no screw for shoulder stock. So this is the civilian configuration of the gun. Large oval trigger guard and back strap, both silver plated brass. All of the originals were silver plated. Okay, they, they were silver plated brass. They make the replicas out of brass without silver plating them, just to save a little bit of money. Uh, but really, they should be silver plated to, to be an accurate rendition. It's a six shot gun, 36 caliber, cone front sight, hammer nose rear sight. And the action is really nice. I've got to tell you, when I first got this, uh, I was so excited that I pulled it out of the box and I cocked it and it was like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, it hardly wanted to move. And I was pretty sure I knew what the issue was uh, because most of these guns were bought, right, as collector's pieces. So this gun, I am quite sure just from looking at the cylinder, has never, ever been shot. The color case hardening is uh, traditional bone charcoal color case hardening. Uh, Colt's, Colt's process for many, many years. And it is absolutely gorgeous. No chemical color case hardening here. This is all the real deal. And the blue is Colt's Royal Blue. This is not the blue that would have been used in the 19th century. Uh, and that would have been a much less durable blue than we have than we have now. This is uh, Colt's good later 20th century blue. Uh, their early 20th century blue, which I have on a couple of guns, is called Carbona Bluing, which is done in ovens. It's not uh, salt-based at all. And it is phenomenal. But, you know, Colt's known for their finishes, and these guns are among the most beautiful Colts ever made. So that's the gun in its fitted case. And there are some accoutrements, as we like to say. So we've got right here a key to the case, so it can be locked, and a bullet mold. And this bullet mold is a copy of the mold that Colt used to provide with these guns. It does a round ball and it does a conical. <clears throat> you can actually cast with this thing, though it does not make a high-quality bullet. Uh, and, of course, you're holding a red-hot brass mold. But um, I'm, I'm going to stick to my Eras Gone molds to do my casting. But this is a beautiful accessory to have in the box. We also have a reproduction of the British captains that Colt provided by Ely Brothers. So, on today's market, if this had been filled with caps, filled with caps, it would have been worth about as much as the gun, probably. But uh, just a nice little case and quite functional. And then a very functional 
powder flask. Uh, this is much heavier than the typical reproduction flask that you would get. It's spring loaded, right? And it has the angled spout to make it more convenient for actually charging the gun. That's just a beautiful piece of gear. And then the final piece of gear that comes in the set is a Colt L-shaped nipple wrench and screwdriver, just, just like the 19th century versions. So all of this fits in this beautiful lined case. Let me move this up a bit. There we go. There. Everything fits in here. And it's just a beautiful presentation. Now, I know the previous owner of this did not shoot it. And I suspect that many of the owners of these guns have not shot them. Uh, but that's not going to be the case with this owner of this gun. So the next step for this is going to be out to the range, where we're going to see what it can do. I'm really looking forward to shooting this. Well, I hope you enjoyed this first look at the Robert E. Lee 1851 Navy commemorative. Um, you know, like I said during the video, this is a gun I wanted for a long time because it is known as the best of the best second generation Colts. Um, and having looked at it in great detail, I've got to say, I think it is. Uh, I have a Colt 1860 Army in the F series. And like I said, this is actually a pre C series gun. Uh, but I've got an F series, which was actually made in the Ivor Johnson plant to Colt specifications. And that is a beautiful, gorgeous gun. And it shoots excellently. Um, this one's even nicer. <laughs> and, you know, like I said, this is 100% real Colt. Um, so, the only way to get more authentic than this is to have a first generation. And I have one of those too. So, next time you see this gun, it'll be out on the range. And next time you see me, it'll be next week. So until then, bye.